I hear that people are scared, investors are investing less. And fun fact, not only investors are yeah. investing less, but also the best founders are postponing their fundraising. So if you're a really good founder uh, with a really good company and you know what you're doing, they yeah. intentionally, they, they, let's say they had planned to raise now, they say, okay, let's change our plans, you know, cut our costs and raise in six months because we're going to have bad terms. We can build something and solve a problem, but who are we solving it for? How are we going to monetize mm. it? How are we going to have an impact? And, and they don't come back. So you have to continuously engage and re-engage and it's kind of, you know, trying to fill a bathtub with a hole at the bottom. It's so one uh, thing to so. like have these ideas in principle and then a completely different thing to actually put your skin in the game. Well, uh, Steph, I, I think uh, over the course of the last month, I have been talking to a couple of people, uh, a lot of founders, and a lot of them have raised an issue, a query to me that, you know, they are trying to understand how to raise funding. Mm-hmm. And more often than not, now I have a go-to website I sent to them, and that is OpenVC. And cool. I've, been, I've been trying to explain them how OpenVC works. And the way I explain it to them is you send in you send in a, a well-designed pitch deck, which will be reviewed by staff and team. And, and then uh, upon approval, it will be sent to verified VCs. To which the question is, how does OpenVC decide which VCs to send it to? Which okay. when I am, I, yeah, yeah. So I think that was like the first question. Okay. Uh, and, and, you know, that's the question from the founders. And there are a lot of other such questions, I think, which, which we'll be discussing today. Okay. Uh, with that, I would say, w- welcome to the Research Labs podcast. Thanks, man. I'm glad to be here. Before we, you know, jump right into OpenVC, I, I would actually prefer if we like maybe take a step back and talk about how we got started, not with OpenVC, but like going way back from the early college days. Okay. Okay. So I think it even starts before college in my case. Um, Mm -hmm. So I was born in a family of, uh, of small business owners. Uh, My dad was a hotel uh, owner and manager. Uh, He started from the uh, very bottom and, you know, made his way up. And so, yeah. That's when I got the entrepreneurship bug, I would say. I realized, yeah. okay, you know, I, it's a life that is completely different from, from anything else. Uh, you're, uh, you have responsibilities, you're accountable for everything, you have ownership in the best and the worst ways. And, uh, yeah. you know, growing up in that environment, uh, I, I just knew that's what I wanted to do. And then mm. parallel to that, my entertainment was video games and then moving forward to internet, computers, all that stuff, IT. And, you know, uh, yeah. when I uh, entered college, I found out about startups, uh, which at the time, I mean, it was a big thing, but I was not really aware of that because it, it was not yeah. my, you know, my world at all. And I was like, hey, that's crazy. Like, there is this thing where I can both be a like, business owner and an entrepreneur, and at the same time, I can... Uh, be in the world of tech and for me this was where i found like it's a perfect combo for me and on top of that if you're really good if you're really successful you can have yeah. a big impact and and have very good lifestyle and make a lot of money so it's like that's that's yeah. exactly what i want to do and that's really how i got started in this tech startup thing yeah so uh, right after college did you always decide that okay as soon as i get out of college i want to start something or did you think that, okay, maybe let me just work with a company maybe and learn how they do it and then start something of my own? Yeah, I, that's a good question. And I asked myself that question, you know, what is the optimal time uh, to, 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 and, and yes, I joined the company first. Uh, I felt that yeah. one, I needed more experience, but also two, I didn't have much to bring to the table as a founder. Mm. Uh, I think it's great to launch if you're still 
uh, students because you don't have much to lose. But that, that time frame right after college uh, is probably high value uh, and is probably a good way to get exposed to more business uh, opportunities, expand your network, you know, grow out of your students' um, uh, close environments and experience the real business world because then you understand, okay, that's what it is. You learn a lot of stuff. The first yeah. few years are very, very uh, productive. Uh, the learning curve is very steep and so you learn a lot of things. If you can, you know, get a good job in a good company. So I started in consulting and, and I mean, both consulting and let's say tech, like startup accelerators. So I got exposed to a lot, a lot, a lot of, of business stuff. And, uh, and I also could connect with a lot of, of really smart people. And, and this kind of shaped my trajectory moving forward. So when you say shaped, right, what were like the few, I would say, observations that you had? in particular, which made you more convinced that, you know, you want to start something like OpenVC? Um, so I wouldn't say, I mean, this was not clear from the beginning. I knew I wanted to start something. And like, I guess a lot of people today, I know I want to be a founder. But I don't know what the product yeah. is going to be. I don't know, you know, where I'm really good at, but I know I want to start a startup. So you're, I'm kind of this, you know, I was kind of this type of person who is looking for a great idea and co-founders yeah. and doesn't know really where to start. Um, and so before OpenVC, I actually tried several things. Uh, some projects, yeah. you know, I worked on them for two weeks. Some I worked on them for two months or more. Um, and just at some point, you know, every day, every time you kind of learn a little something, uh, you know, and, and you take this with you for your next project. So I never knew this would be OpenVC. OpenVC started in a very organic way. I'm not going to expand too much on that uh, right now, but uh, ju just to say, I didn't know OpenVC would grow into my main startup. I just started it as a side project, and then it just grew uh, yeah. naturally. But uh, there was no, no strong intent at that point. Yeah. Uh, I tried uh, the first few like, projects I worked on. I tried to grow them with intent and I realized, okay, it's not working. So let's just do stuff on the side and see what works. And that's when I found out, okay, OpenVC is actually the right project for me. I see. So, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that, you know, you tried a couple of things and, you know, that makes me wonder, like, what, what was the selection process to decide, okay, this, are, this is a good idea. Or, or I would say we can maybe go a step forward before the selection process. Like, how, how do you even come up with startup ideas? Uh, I'm, I don't know exactly. Um, I, yeah. It's something I'm, I'm really, I want to read more on this. You know, the ideation process for me is still a bit mysterious. Uh, obviously, yeah. uh, I would say there are like two or three frameworks. There is one where you experience a pain point so you start yeah. from okay i have a pain point i know a lot about it because i've experienced it and then you need to find out yeah. can i solve it and is it big enough to build a company um yeah. so that's that's one approach the second approach is i guess more an intent based or discovery based so you don't have a problem but you want to find a problem because you want to build a solution because you want to be a founder and i've been in that position for a long time because you know i didn't have much business experience and so I try to see problems everywhere. I remember for a long time, I was always trying to say, oh, I hear people talking, there is a conversation, I, I watch a documentary, or, and I'm like, okay, can I make, is this a business opportunity? And kind of always, you know, this kind of intensity and frustration of not, not finding a yeah. good business. So I don't think I'm a great person to tell you how to find an idea because I'm not really good at that. Mm -hmm. So my, my technique was just yeah, yeah. having a Google Doc and I would, every time yeah. I had an idea, I would write it down and describe it in a few sentences. And I still have this Google Doc. Um, yeah. And, and then it becomes pro probably like a process because when you start thinking like that, you become better and better. And then I had a few yeah. friends. I still have those friends uh, who yeah. are also in you know, tech and startups. And we would talk a lot with each other and exchange notes, uh, challenge each other, say, hey, I had this idea, like I have this friend you know, message them, right? Hey, a new business idea. I described like three bit points. Yeah. What do you think? You know, 
And yeah. then you grow with yeah, people yeah. and you grow as you go through ideas, you be, become better at that. So I, I, guess, I guess it's more like a process and you learn, mm -hmm. learn by doing it. And I'm not, I'm not great at that. So I don't have a lot of advice to give on this. <laughs> yeah, but I, I would say you definitely stumbled upon a very good idea, I would say. Thank you. <laughs> with, with, open, with, with Open VC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I'm subscribed to your newsletter and you guys send out like a weekly stat mm -hmm. and the, the numbers are pretty impressive. I would say if you're, if it's like, you know, you're attracting, like, I would say a lot of startups on a weekly basis who are sending, who are reaching out to you, you know, hoping that you guys would be able to help them. So if you're able to like generate that for like the very early stage startups, then I would say, you know, there are a lot of things that can be built on top of it. Probably. Uh, and it's true. We have a lot of people come to us with a lot of hope. I sometimes receive, you know, a lot of very nice messages, emails from people who, uh, who need help and they feel that yeah. OpenVC is solving a problem for them. So that's, that's great, of course. Uh, and sometimes I also feel that, um, you know, I cannot help them because uh, maybe they are too early or, you know, they're still missing uh, a few big things. Like I have actually one person right now, maybe he's going to see this video, he will recognize himself, who um, tried to reach out to investors who rejected his submission several times. And he's like, hey, I don't understand. Like, like, how is this supposed to work? And I'm like, I would love to help you, but you're just too early and you don't have enough signal to, you know, to be successful with investors. I mean, the kind of investors are targeting. Maybe start with, you know, accelerators or stuff like that. So it's, uh, it's, it's great and a lot of people come to us, it's true. But sometimes it's also a bit uh, frustrating when you have to disappoint people because at the end of the day, we don't want to be gatekeepers, but we have to, to screen a little bit, like, you know, projects and people. And so, yeah. Yeah. And, and what, what are like the, you know, reviews or I would say the perspectives of the VCs? How how do how are they looking at open VC at this point? Uh, so far, I only heard good stuff. So maybe they don't want to tell me the bad yeah. stuff. Uh, but if you go to yeah. openvc.app slash love, you will see all the you know testimonials uh, on Twitter. It's like what people say about us. So it's not you know yeah. fake testimonials. It's actual like spontaneous words from people and investors. Yeah. Um, they like the quality of the deal flow. They like the volume. They like the fact that it's free and that we don't try to, you know, uh, act as a paywall between them and the founders, uh, which of course yeah. is very, very, very important to us. So right now it's great. We, we've had a few invest on, investments happen, you know, through our intros. So we're, of course, that's yeah. the best for us, right? That's what we want. We want, we want founders to get investments, we want VC to, to, to close deals, and, uh, and we want to do that at scale. So every time this happens, it's a win for us. Um, and yeah. now we just want to replicate that and scale it up as much as we can. You know, you know going, going back to the discussion we were having about coming up with the idea of OpenVC, how, how were the initial days like? like how, how did you decide, okay, or how did you even think about doing something like this? Like, was it very obvious so, after talking to the founders? Yeah. So um, I've been a founder raising funds with four previous companies. So I've been on the founder side. And even before that, my first job out of business school was at Microsoft Accelerator. And I was receiving deal flow. So I was in the investor position, uh, screening yeah. a lot of deal flow. And so I experienced yeah. both sides of the table. And I, I knew this was a pain point. So for me, this was a no-brainer. Like I knew there was a problem. I knew there was a need. Yeah. But yeah. But I there was no clear way to solve it. And still today, it's not mm. obvious how you're going to solve it because basically, like the best founders and the best VCs, they're going to find each other regardless. The yeah. the yeah, yeah. let's say less experienced, lower level, you know, founders, uh, they're not going to get investments anyway. So the question is like, who are you building for and what are you optimizing yeah. for? Um, and it's, it's not obvious. And on top of that, you're in a space that is small. It's not big volumes. Yeah. Um, founders are poor. VCs are cheap. 
because they live off management fees, so they don't have a lot of budget to spend. So there's not even a lot of money yeah. to make in that space, you know, what we're doing. And I, I say that, but if you speak to anybody who's building a similar product, and I speak to a lot yeah. of them, um, it's not, uh, you know, we're not building a CRM uh, for, you know, large corporations and they have big budgets for that. We're not building, yeah. we're, in a, we're in a poor space. So the question is, okay, we can Makes build sense. something and solve a problem, but who are we solving it for? How are we going to monetize mm. it? How are we going to have an impact and, and have yeah. that scale? So that, that's, not, that's not obvious, but back to your question about how we got the idea. The idea to, came from, okay, there is a problem, there's a need, and, um, and we, we have to try something. And then the, the, the first step to try it was very easy because we just put out a, like a, a list online. So there was very little effort for the first step. And when we saw yeah. the, the positive feedback of everybody, then we know, okay, let's you know, build the next step and then build the next step. So yeah, yeah. it's very gradual like that. And, and you know, once, let's say, people started coming in, did it kind of give you a feeling that maybe you guys are on to something? Of course. Uh, but yeah. I'm, um, I'm a bit of a, how do you say, cynic person. So I know people yeah. may come to your product, uh, but eventually never pay for it, or come to your product for yeah, all yeah. the wrong reasons. Or maybe the people you get are actually the bad founders, as I said. So, yeah. you know, until it's not done, until it's done, right? So I'm not going to... Uh, claim okay we made it you know we're successful whatever no we're not we'll be successful when we yeah. have a sustainable business that we can you know maybe uh, pay ourselves uh, decent salaries uh, grow the company uh, and replicate that success again and again and again and when I say success I mean investments closed investments so we're on the way to it every day we improve a little yeah. we find new you know hacks and tricks and ways to improve yeah um, yeah. But uh, yeah, we're not there yet. But, you know, you take the you take the wins, but you don't uh, you don't get intoxicated with it. That that makes sense. And uh, along the way, for example, right when you are solving a problem, like you know, you are the startup's startup. If you if if that makes sense, like yes, you're solving yes. a problem for like the the first stages of a startup, which I, I would presume, I wouldn't say it's the hardest part, hardest part, because it, it gets hard if, as soon as you start growing as well. So what, what, what are like few of the, I would say, patterns that you're observing now? The pattern when regarding... When you look at... What? Yeah, so patterns regarding like what kind of ideas people are coming up with, or do you see like a lot of people just replicating what you have already seen in the past? Okay, so there are several patterns for sure. Um, you have the pattern where people replicate in their geography something that has been a model that is successful in another geography. So typically, I've, I've seen a really cool pro project recently of, um, it was a, like a marketplace for one-stop shop for wedding uh, ceremonies. Like, you know, you have your uh, everything you need to organize a ceremony uh, in one yeah. place with a marketplace that connects all the vendors with the, the bride and the groom in Bangladesh. You know? So this is a model that has been successful wow. in, you know, in the US and now the guys are yeah. basically building copycats in Bangladesh and they have strong numbers, yeah. strong team. Uh, I yeah. mean, it's very early, but it looks very promising. And I love when I see these kind of deals in my deal from like, man, like we're really helping like I've never been to Bangladesh. I, I don't know the country or the people uh, at all. But yeah. I think it's so cool that we can help uh, this kind of business grow over there. So that's one pattern, which is the yeah. like local copycat, and it's great. Um, yeah. Another pattern I see, um, and it's not a great one, it's when people, you know, you have a, a, a few projects that are this kind of recurring project that, I don't know, like 20 people are trying at the same time, and it's been tried 200 times before. And it's never working yeah. because maybe there's no business or it's kind of obvious idea, that, which is actually a, uh, turns out not to be a great idea. So maybe someone will be successful with it, but so far I haven't seen it work. Stuff like, a, let's yeah. say, a social network to find people to do sports with you. Right? 
I've, I've, I see this yeah. know, twice a month in my deal flow. And yeah. um, again, maybe someone is going to, you know, crack the nuts and, and succeed with this project. But um, yeah, I see a lot of people build that. And usually when you get a the team, they don't have much business experience. And it's just people who wanted to build a startup and they went with the first idea they could think of. Uh, but when you dig a little bit, it turns out uh, it's not really. Another one, for example, is the personal CRM. You know, uh, people who try to build a CRM for yourself. So you have your CRM, I have my CRM. It aggregates uh, contacts from all our social networks, all our life. Seems like a great idea. I know, I know three or four teams of really smart people who tried building this and yeah. failed. And now there are two more companies who are trying. Uh, one is them is YC backed. Uh, the other one is also still our team. We will see. But uh, this is the less positive pattern where, uh, you know, um, I just don't know uh, if it's not successful. And then the rest of it is, you know, like normal startup projects. Um, people come up with an idea, build it, and, and uh, try their hardest. I see. And then I, I also was a part of the OpenVC uh, deck roast. Oh, yeah. Who's, whose, idea was, whose idea was that? So it was uh, an idea of mine because, yeah. um, you know, in the, like this year, we rejected a lot of founders from our deal flow because their pitch deck was not yeah. good enough. And then they were like, okay, so tell me what's wrong. And they're like, man. So, and what I did is I use, I make them, you know, short videos, like 10, 12 minute videos to tell them, okay, you have to improve this, that, that, that. This is not how it's done. This sends all the wrong messages. This is bad signal. Oh, you have something great, yeah. but you put it in slide 27, put it earlier. By the way, 27 slides is too many. Make 12 slides. Okay. And it's yeah. always the same thing. I kept repeating the same thing. So I was like, how can we, again, scale it up? And because I cannot do like free consulting for 10,000 founders per month. Um, so yeah. how can I? And so the, the roast was basically a way to educate mm -hmm. our audience, our founder yeah. audience, especially first-time founders, uh, to the standards. Like, this is what is expected. Yeah. You're playing a game that has rules, and you have to learn yeah. the rules, do your homework, and come prepared. That makes so sense. So if you yeah. just, you know, spam, you're not going to spam a 1,000 investors, first, because we're not going to let you. <laughs> can be sure of that. Yeah. And, and second, even if we, even if we did, uh, you would fail. So it's in nobody's interest to do that. And um, increasingly, part of our job at OpenVC has been educating founders about and giving them awareness of where they stand in the market because um, a lot of them just don't realize because they've never done that before. I was the same before and um, it's normal. It's part of the process. So we try to accelerate that learning curve for all the founders. Yeah. Uh, so I understand, okay, like actually I'm too early for VCs. Maybe I should speak to angels. And we just save them, you know, four months of uh, of, of failures. Now the that downside is, is that we're judging people and projects, and who are we to judge? You know, that's the the downside. Uh, we're in a tough position, and uh, some people don't like it, and I completely understand. But at some point, uh, we have to call the shots, and so that's uh, we're trying to do in the most um, in the f most uh, honest way we can. That makes sense. And on the website, it says it's an open project mm -hmm. and it, it's called open VC. Yeah. So I understand the VC part. Could, would, you, would you share, how, how did you guys come up with the open part of it? Sure. Um, so what does it mean when you say we're open? It means that the project is run on open data. What it means mm -hmm. is that the database is under Creative Commons license. So anybody can download the data sets and uh, use it. Uh, when, so it's like, imagine if you use a Crunchbase and you could download the spreadsheet of all of Crunchbase data. So that's basically what it means. And the reason why we yeah. do that is because the data we have um, comes from the users. The community contributes with data. We don't scrape anything. We don't do the research ourselves. We just provide the, yeah. the container and we let people fill it with content. So because people yeah. contribute for free, they receive the yeah. data the data set for free. 
the only thing we don't include in the data set, of course, is private information. So we're not going to give you the email addresses. We're not going to give you this kind of stuff, the photos uh, of, of people. But other than that, yeah. the data is open. And um, yeah, this was the original ethos of the company. I mean, it was not a company, the ethos of the project. Um, yeah. Building something, you know, by founders, for founders, this kind of thing. Wikipedia for VCs, that kind of thing. So I, I, I do understand this part, okay. But I'm curious to understand, like, where does it actually come from? Like, is, oh. is it something that you guys were always inspired by? Mm -hmm. Like, Okay. Uh, so for one thing, yes. I've always, you know, I love this kind of open projects. Um, you know, WordPress is insanely yeah. successful. Uh, Ghost TMS more recently. Um, uh, yeah. Wikipedia, you know, everybody knows Wikipedia. And this, this was also our ambition, right? Uh, I'd rather have something open and yeah. free and not make money, but actually have a global impact and empower, you know, all founders mm -hmm. worldwide than charging people, you know, $100 a month to access the database and, and help nobody. And it's just not exciting for me. It's not exciting for Lucas, my co-founder. We didn't want to do that. Yeah. And yeah. so at some point we will monetize, of course, um, but we'll try to do that without breaking the original promise. And the original promise is, open and free and open is a, yeah. another, another way to say free you know it's like it's free because it's open it's open because it's free it goes together so the inspiration for it was yeah this this is what was exciting for us another aspect is this kind of product is not going to sell very well because again founders don't have money uh, this is mm. don't have much money either surprisingly um once you understand yeah. how they, they they work so if you want people to use your product, you have to find a way to, to give it out for free and make it open to everyone. You know, most, most, most people or most services who provide this kind of service connect you know, founders and VCs. They are very closed, right? It's kind of closed networks, lo closed local networks. And we're like, F that, you know, we're going to do our way and we're going to completely yeah, yeah, flip yeah. the model uh, head over heels and and go open. It's very counterintuitive. And actually, a lot of people, they like that because they, they think VCs, they think uh, closed doors. They think behind the curtains. Yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah. Um, and we're like, okay, but where? You know what? We're going to do open VC because, because it's crazy and because nobody's going to do that. And, and this uh, gave us a lot of, I think, a goodwill. People loved the concept. Even if I don't know what we do, just open VC that, that has, you know, it resonates with people. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I, I do understand this, I, I would say from a strategy perspective, but I, I, I would say I was very curious as to like what made you and Lucas actually care about it so much. They're spending so much of your time building something like this. You know? I don't know. Like it's, it's know. one thing to so. like have these ideas in principle and then a completely, completely different thing to actually put your skin in the game, you know? Uh -huh. Okay. Um, okay, so maybe there is also an unfair advantage we have uh, is that we're not full-time yeah. on OpenVC. We both make money uh, with our... Uh, I'm a freelance consultant. Lucas is a freelance developer. So in a way, we can afford to give it out for free. Um, and I guess yeah, a lot yeah. of people, maybe they share the same ideas and principles as we do, but they just cannot afford to yeah. work for free. In our case... We're lucky we can that is true. and uh, yeah, yeah. and so we we seize that opportunity um but then more deeply i think we're part of that you know modern generation uh more, more like society type of thing where we do not we don't care just about the money but also about the impact and and giving access to to people even those who you know cannot maybe afford the, the hundred dollars a month subscription but are actually doing something meaningful and and, uh, and we want to help. So I don't know. Uh, I, I guess we were born like that. I don't know. I cannot give you a better answer. Yeah, yeah. And do, do you think there will come a stage where you will maybe do like an open VC community or a forum where all the founders can talk to each other maybe? Mm. So this one, we thought about that a lot again and again. We decided mm. against it. Uh, we do yeah. have uh, so just FYI, we have a small like Slack group now, but it's for OpenVC okay. users. They can ask questions to each other, uh, report bugs, suggesting features, these yeah. kind of things. 
but it's not really a community like a social network or something like that. Um, and the yeah. reason is that people don't use it. In my experience, uh, there are tons and tons and tons of you know Slack group for entrepreneurs. Uh, some of them are really good. Uh, in Europe, I really like Innovators Room. Uh, I think uh, Stefan yeah. van Perger is doing a great, great job. But it's super hard because most people, they come to those groups because they want some information or need some help. They take what they want and then they don't contribute. They don't come back. So you have to continuously engage and re-engage. And it's kind of you know trying to fill a, a bathtub with a hole at the bottom. Uh, yeah. It's uh, extenuating. Um, I'm not sure about the value. I mean, for sure, you help a lot of people, but I would hate it that it doesn't um, like consolidate at some point. Or yeah, I, I see a lot of, of those groups, and I've never seen one stick pretty much. So that's why we decided against it. Maybe it will change, you know, opinion. I'm open to that. But right now, we have so much to do, and this is definitely not a priority. Keep in mind, we're just two people it, working part time. So. Including only one developer. Yeah. So, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, if, if if when you think about let's say uh, building the features out, right? How how does that process look like? In the sense, mm. are you talking to a lot of customers? Okay. Do you sit down and brainstorm as to okay, this yes. is yes, what yes. we should be doing? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I I spoke with my users even before. I thought about OpenVC. Like I've I've spent almost ten years in that space, startups and VCs, and accelerators yeah. and incubators and startup studios and angels. That's my daily bread, right? So, I, of course, I had to deep dive a little bit, and I, you know, I do like user interviews, uh, discovery interviews, all that stuff, um, and it's very important. Uh, of course, if you don't do that, it's probably not going to end very well. Um, and and then so we we try to really define the core features that we want to build. So we work in like kind of batches. So you know we decide okay we want this like two three four new features for you know the next uh, release. Um, I draft them on Google uh, Slides. Actually, we don't even use Figma or any. I use Google Slides because of my you know consulting background. So I'm very comfortable with a uh, PowerPoint type software. So all the features are designed in yeah. Google Slides. I give the Google Slides to to uh, Lucas, who builds them, and then I change half of it, and he hates me. And uh, <laughs> and then we <laughs> test it with the users, and then what happens is uh, we usually find that some stuff is not used as we expected. Some stuff uh, doesn't, uh, you know, and and we have to do adjustment, and we have to build a little more. To make it actually usable, uh, so it's a lot of trial yeah. and error. I think we could probably do that better. I mean, not I'm, I'm sure we can do that better. Um, we're not following you know textbook product development uh, approaches, but I don't know for where we are right now, the resource we have, the time we have. It's not that bad. I mean, we have to fix a lot of stuff. We maybe we waste too much time. I don't know, but uh, we also learn as we ship. You know, we ship stuff. Yeah. It's half baked, and and then we activate the little chat box on the website, and people says, "Oh, this is broken. Oh, this doesn't work. Oh, how do I do this?" And then there's, "Oh, shit, then we need to we need to improve this. We need to fix that." And because it's already in production, we don't even have time to. We have to fix it right now. So it gives us a sense of urgency, and it's kind of forcing us to build what people want. Uh, again, we don't have much resource at all, which is forcing us to be very lean. Uh, just to give you an example, um, until yeah. last month, so for the first like for the first eighteen months of OpenVC, if you wanted to change your password, you had to email me. So you click on like reset my password because you lost your password, let's say, and it's going to tell you email yeah. Stefan to ask uh, like to change your password. Because we haven't even built yeah. that feature, which seems like a basic Makes thing sense. to do, but for us, it's already too much work. It doesn't bring value. So you know yeah, what? Yeah. You want to change your password? Email me, and I'll do it for you. And that's how, you know, how lean we build at OpenVC. 
<laughs> you know, probably you can teach a lot to all the startup founders who keep on building features that nobody wants to use. Like you are like the definition of oh, yeah, a super lean startup, you know. Because we don't have a choice. That's the thing. And if you take too much money too early or just take money too early from investors, you're going to build yeah. more than you need. And you're going to spend more than you need and it's not, it's not healthy. So it's good to be, you know, it's, it's hard to be lean when you have money. It's something that people don't necessarily That understand. is very true. When yeah, you have yeah. money, you're going to spend it. It's maybe sometimes better to refuse taking money. In our case, we have been, you know, because we, of course, we interact with investors every day. So we had several, yeah. you know, spontaneous offers. Hey, uh, do you guys want to take my money? I'd love to invest in what you're building. And we've re re rejected yeah. all those offers because we feel, okay, what if we take the money? We're going to build stuff that we, that we think could be successful, yeah. but we're going to overbuild. Uh, we're going to yeah. burn cash. It's not, it's not what we should do. It's not the right thing to do. Right. So I guess yeah, it's yeah, maybe yeah. quite different from how a lot of people think, but we're happy like that. Yeah. And and so you know, uh, currently we we are in a I would say a recession, although uh, no one is confirming it. But the news out there is that we are in a recession, and that we are in this thing mm -hmm. they are terming as, as as the VC winter. VCs are not very open to you know giving out the money right now. So mm -hmm. how how do you see that? In the sense, do you, do you see things changing too fast? For the founders and for the VCs from where you are sitting, right? You're looking at so many companies and so many VCs at the same time. Do you see any change from before? Like, what are your observations on it? Okay, so I have several observations. The first one is that we don't have enough, at OpenVC, we don't have enough metrics and analytics and stuff like that to significantly see trends, right? We're not AngelList. So we cannot tell you, oh, yes, we yeah, see yeah. valuations are down 20% in our data, just to be clear. So what I'm going to share is my personal yeah. like, feeling, but it's not backed by our, our data. Um, yeah. I think a lot of great startups have been founded in recessions. Um, Airbnb, for example, was one of them. Um, so, you know, uh, life always finds a way, as they say. And, um, and I... I think great founders, it will just, you know, um, kill the flock and the best founders will find ways. Uh, White Combinator had published a, a letter called um, Default Alive or something like that, saying that as a startup, you yeah, should try yeah, to be yeah. default, alive by default. Like if you have no more funding, you should still be able to, you know, keep going and fulfill your mission. I really love that, that concept. I think it's very true. In our case, OpenVC, we're a startup ourselves. But because yeah. of, of the way we set up, because we're so lean, we don't care. Like personally, I don't feel because I don't have investors, you know, I don't feel uh, scared. We don't have funding. We're not going to be able to raise the next round. I don't care. Right now we're building. Yeah. We're building what we have. We're doing what we have to do, regardless of the funding yeah. environment. Um, and, and once we maybe have some revenue, we can you know, grow on our own. Maybe you're going to raise funds at some point, but... We, we don't live for that. That's us, you know, as yeah. a company, but then from, a, from the, our user perspective, I mean, this yeah. is going to be tough because hmm. what I hear, and I spoke with a, a big VC firm in France today, uh, this morning. Yeah. I hear that people are scared, investors are investing less. Um, and fun fact, not that investors are yeah. investing less, but also the best founders are postponing their fundraising. So if you're a really good founder uh, with a really good company and you know what you're doing, they yeah. intentionally, they, they, let's say they had planned to raise now, they say, okay, let's change our plans, you know, cut our costs and raise in six months because we're going to have bad terms. And so what's happening is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know. Um, yeah. Maybe, I mean, for sure, there is uh, an impact in late stage startups in the US, but watch, why should it impact, you know, pre-seed startups in uh, the south of France? I, I don't really know, yeah. but it does because everybody's connected, everybody's going through the same, 
uh, anxiety, um, the, the same, the, they hear the same words about the recession. And so everybody becomes yeah. scared. Uh, not sure it's for good reasons, but that's what's happening regardless. So, yes, uh, I think this is happening. But I also think that if you have a strong startup right now, you have some good numbers and uh, you're in a good position, you can be aggressive right now because there's going to be a lot of talents you know, looking to be hired because they've been just fired a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and because a lot of players are going to play the defensive now, so it can be more offensive. At the end of the day, it's a case by case situation. Yeah, yeah. I don't think, you know, uh, I I still hear at the same time I still hear of crazy deals happening at crazy valuations still in that environment. So, my yeah. conclusion is yes, for the average founder, it's going to be harder. Um, one thing for sure is that investors will change the way they invest. So maybe in 2021, 2020, if they didn't care so much about valuations. As long as they could see some some excitement, you know, positive signal, they would just invest because they yeah. knew you, you would be able to raise your next round 12, 18 months from now. So they didn't really care. Now we're going back to more of like a first principles approach or yeah. uh, how do you how do you call that? Like, you know, it's based on sound principles, not based on momentum and and uh, signaling, which is probably healthier, I guess. Yeah. We will see. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so you were talking about uh, corporate politics in your consulting yes. business. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Um, because the type of consulting I do is is specializes in innovation, which means change, which means yeah. uh, that uh, you have to change the way people work, or even worse, have them change the way they work. Right. Because you cannot force people. People don't like being yeah. forced, and it never works. So it's a lot of nudging. It's a lot of guiding. It's a lot of uh, showing the way. Um, and but doing that at scale is difficult. Um, and it's a it's something I've done. I mean, I've done that for five years now. Yeah, five years already. Uh, still yeah. a lot of fun. Um, and uh, and I'm lucky enough to have some really good clients with interesting challenges. So, but that's of course very different from OpenVC. That's my cheat code. Yeah. This 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 yeah. friends activities, you know, how I can keep OpenVC running without charging for now. So yeah, I don't yeah. know if it's of a lot of interest for your audience, but still, that's what I do. So I think it's very interesting because when when you say. Uh... You, you help your clients with challenges, right? With with uh, innovative strategies. Could you, could you like, you know, uh, share a little bit about what do your clients define as challenges? Mm, okay. So, um, I'll give you a couple of examples. So, I've worked with yes. uh, a European car manufacturer and mm -hmm. they wanted to engage... Um, so basically, there's a lot of changes right now in the car industry, right? Electric cars, self-driving yeah. cars, and these are big changes, right? They're not, I mean, it's, it's going to take a bit of time, but it's going to have yeah. a massive impact on those industries. And for those players, um, if you have, let's say you're, I don't know, a German or French car manufacturer, and you specialize in uh, petrol engines, right? You're not going to change your whole company, your 10,000, 20,000 employees, and have them shift to you know, electric engines because it's not possible. And then you cannot suddenly have um, self-driving engineers, like especially software engineers who specialize in that. You cannot create that function out of nowhere. So how do you, yeah. how do you make sure you still exist and thrive 15 years from now? And so the answer mm. for that client was, we're going to set up a corporate venture capital fund, a CVC fund, mm -hmm. and we're going to invest worldwide in um, the, you know, the most relevant uh, startups for us. And then yeah. how do you execute on that? So we need to build a team. Uh, so we need to you know, find or poach 
uh, partners from other VC firms. Uh, and we need yeah. to be attractive because we're corporate. I mean, we're a big corporation, so we're not very sexy. We're not very attractive. So how do we attract those people? Then uh, we need to leverage our own internal resources because we have brilliant engineers. We have some internal knowledge, but it's all in silos. And we want to bring that knowledge to the guys in the CVC so they can make the right decisions. Um, and that's not easy at all because you have, we're working across time zones, across languages, across cultures. Um, yeah, and then you need to fund that. Uh, this fund that we started was uh, half a billion dollar uh, in asset under management, so it's not small. It's quite big actually. Uh, yeah. So what's the you know portfolio construction? Uh, how do you model that? Uh, how do you get the buy-in from the shareholders and from the uh, from the internal stakeholders? Um, so I mean, you know. A million things to do. Uh, I'm not doing that alone. Huh? Uh, this project, we're a team, and but uh, this is the yeah. kind of stuff I, I can deal with. This is one specific case. So building a corporate VC fund yeah, for, yeah. for this car maker. Another one was um, building, a, for example, uh, a startup, uh, an internal like corporate startup incubator, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And how do we make sure that this incubator is not going to be just another empty, useless, worthless? corporate program, but actually have an impact, actually help the startups and help the, the corporation funding it. Yeah. So yeah, this, this, this kind of projects I do. Other projects may be more related to learning and development. So, yeah, you know, this was a, like, this time was a Korean company and the guys, they wanted to, so, you know, the Korean culture is very, uh, I mean, it's, it's a really cool culture, but um, sometimes lagging behind in some fields, or maybe, uh, I mean, especially when a lot of their clients now are, are Westerners, so they need to be yeah. a, kind of broaden the horizons of the team a little bit. So this, this, yeah, were, yeah, yeah. this was, I mean, about how do you educate uh, and change, gently change the culture in the company, especially for the marketing teams and for the management team, the senior the senior people, because, you know, they, especially in the Korean uh, culture, you know, it's very hierarchical. So you want the people at the top yeah. to be aware of those changes and, and allow them. You know. But you, you, again, yeah. you cannot tell them what to do. So you have to show them and let them get to the conclusions of what needs to be done. Yeah, so this is the kind of stuff I do. I see. You know, in the, in the first example, when you're helping a car company, right? So what does that process look like for you from your end? Is it a lot of research to understand, okay, what is the market? What is the competition? What are the technologies that are coming up? Man, I mean, consulting is consulting. So it's Excel, PowerPoint, and meetings. You know, uh, and then, of course, you follow frameworks, you follow your you know, processes, you talk to people. It's a lot, and the bigger the project, the more back-channeling you do. So, you know, you, you, your client wants to reach an objective, and you're going to go one by one, talk to people, get them on board, show them what's in it for them, you know, uh, so that when everybody's in the meeting room and you present the project for the first time, actually everybody around the yeah. table is already on board with it. Uh, but you, yeah. <laughs> it all, you know, you, 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 you have to do that in those big structures. <laughs> so that's why I say it's about politics because you cannot just execute. You need to like tick all the boxes before, make sure you're not stepping on every, anybody's yeah. foot, and that's difficult. Because you're gonna if yeah. you if you make significant change, you're gonna step on a lot of feet, yeah. not on purpose, just because that's how those constructions are set up. And you have to identify yeah. okay, who are we going to 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 you know upset, and how can we make sure that actually they support and work with us and not against us. So, yeah. So, in the case of a car company, right? Uh, are there mm -hmm. a lot of discussions about Tesla and how they are doing things? Like, I'm, I'm just assuming, obviously. <laughs> so, in, in their case, so, you know, it's, it's very funny because it shows the, how the human psyche reacts. So, in a lot of meetings, Tesla was kind of the forbidden name. You know, although everybody knows, really? it's like, you know, when Biden, <laughs> when Biden had this big, uh, 
Biden, Biden had this big summit with all the electric car manufacturers and they didn't invite Tesla. And, and the network, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it was a bit like that. And then when you talk to people one on one about that, some of them are, um, you know, very aware, or, you know, and and want to change faster because they say hey, we have to catch up. And, and other people, they're like uh, dismissive, and you know, Tesla, yeah, they will. I mean, I guess not. I mean, at the time because it's a few, few years ago now. Yeah, they never make it. Uh, they're talking a lot, but they're not delivering. Now it has changed. Huh? This project was uh, five years ago. Um, six years ago yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah um, so uh, it's uh, it really depends on people but but in the room so you know I, I used to work yeah. at Microsoft when uh, when Microsoft at the time when they still had the, the Windows phones you know and I remember my, yeah, my boss yeah, yeah. Uh, at the time uh, Pascal great guy uh, so he had yeah. an iPhone personal phone and he yeah. was given his corporate phone I can say that because now he left by Microsoft, so I can say. <laughs> and he had the micro, Microsoft phone. And so he had both phones, but he would never show the iPhone when we're in the office because people would, you know, take offense somehow. <laughs> but the, the Windows phones, they were shit, yeah. right? Uh, they were really, really bad. Yeah, yeah. Um, they, they have, they have, they have. So yeah, I'm... Um, I mean, my job is to be patient. Uh, you cannot expect the same speed from startups and big companies. So, you know, when you're a big, mm-hmm. always a big company, you know, the same project that would take me two weeks here, it's going to take nine months yeah. there. And I'm not exaggerating. That's, that's literally what it is. Wow. It's not my fault. Huh? I move at my client speed. So, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. If, so, as long as they're happy with it, you know, I always try to push them to go faster. I mean, they can, yeah. anybody who's worked with me can tell you that. I always tell them, no, yeah. guys, we can go faster. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, no, we cannot. They cannot. So, okay, fair enough. I, I, I will, I will be patient. Yeah. that's fine. So you know, previously I was asking about Tesla in particular because uh, I would say we are doing a newsletter, and mm-hmm. uh, we we are just gonna start out. And in the newsletter, right, in particular, we are trying to look at tech companies, not from a market or a business perspective, but like, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, we are seeing that Tesla is, let's say, doing Project Dojo, where they are trying to develop supercomputers to analyze the video data that they are collecting from all the cars. Mm-hmm. Yep. And they're also developing a chip of their own, like an AI chip to help help cars process uh, data faster. You know, similarly, there are so many small, small projects that are happening inside of Tesla, which from a business perspective does not really make sense. But if you think of it from a tech perspective or from a product perspective, right, they can prove hopefully a great business going forward. So mm. what, what we are I trying mean, to do, right, is... Know, to, uh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, Amazon started as an e-commerce company. They still do e-commerce. Yeah. But they yeah. make most of their profit from their AWS cloud services, right? And yeah, yeah, yeah. AWS originally, they tried to solve their own problem, and then they realized yeah. they had a great solution and they could sell it to other people. So yeah. I can completely see Tesla doing the same thing. You know, say, okay, look, we yeah. solved this AI chip for us. Uh, let's sell it to other people and compete with, um, you know, Nvidia or other people. That's or Google. That's that's very smart. Um, yeah. So I, I, I don't see a. I think, and, and I think it's one of the things where Elon Musk has proven that, you know, he can manage several companies. He can run a kind of portfolio of activities, and they all benefit from each other, right? He has a, the what's the name again? Solar Solar City. Uh, he has yeah. um, uh, the SpaceX, uh, Tesla, and they all kind of benefit from each other, right? He put a Tesla in a rocket. Yeah. And sent it to, to space, and that's a great marketing stunt for Tesla leveraging SpaceX. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. It, for me, yeah, so you were also like thing. just. Yeah. yeah, you were also joking about you know how, if if they integrate maybe Tesla and Twitter together, how would how would that be like? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I didn't think about that, but yes. 
uh, probably uh, I mean, it's a Amazon private too. company now they can do whatever they want to yeah they can they can i'm very excited to see what's going to happen i'm not taking sides here um yeah people have very strong opinions on those things i don't because i don't know elon musk personally i don't know yeah. i know a couple of people who works at twitter but that's it so yeah we'll see i'm curious and and what what do you think about having extremely strong opinions by the way in the in the sense uh, i i don't understand it when some someone is like super sure right like i am not sure about anything with that much that much power i would say and and you see people with like extremely strong opinions and that does not make sense to me because that's not who i am as a person like i'm very malleable that way you know <laughs> Yeah, but I, I think, and I think actually there's a, a concept about that in psychology. I don't remember. Is it the Dunn-Kroger effect or something like that? Basically, oh. people who are a bit smarter, they tend to also have more moderate opinions and not moderate, but nuanced, right? Uh, you don't need to just yeah. stick extremely to one side or another. And you understand, yeah. you can think more on a case-by-case basis and and step away from your ideology because in one specific case, for example, it doesn't work. Whereas, uh, yeah. you know, people who are maybe uh, not as, uh, you know, intellectually gifted, they just stick to one line because it's convenient for them. So maybe it means that you're very smart. Uh, maybe that's what it means. Uh, you're just very smart and so you're nuanced. Um, or I actually think, yeah. I, I actually think the reverse actually. Like what I mean okay. by that is, like let's say in 2016, right? I had a lot of ideas about how to build Sunday pajamas, and by 2019 or 2018, most of them were wrong, right? And then by 2022, all the ideas I had in 2019 were maybe almost wrong, or I would say inaccurate. And and a lot of things I was thinking about back then about me or the company. they are simply not true so if i stuck i stuck with them i won't be talking to you right now about your car consulting company you know mm. in a way like kind of letting go of the old ideas and embracing what i'm seeing instead of just sticking to what i believe has served yeah. me really well in the business i, I would say 100% uh i like and you know when you're a founder you need to have strong yeah. opinions because you're going to build something that goes against uh the mainstream right uh, yeah, i yeah, like very yeah, yeah. sentence that says that you should have strong ideas loosely held yeah and i really like the sentence yeah. because i think it's it kind of captures uh the truth you need strong opinions yeah. you need strong ideas if you want to do yeah. something innovative and counterintuitive but you also yeah, should yeah. have the the humility to adjust to reality when okay it turns out actually it's not what you thought okay i'll take i'll take a yeah. loss here and i'll pivot i'll adjust uh and so yeah um in that sense uh strong ideas to the hell is a good uh, good policy yeah 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 i think you were you guys are launching programs on open vc uh or what do you I, mean as a program I think I read it on the website. It says coming soon. Oh yeah, we have a section are... called programs. Uh, I'm not yeah. sure we're gonna launch. Is it. it like? Okay. Yeah, we will see this one. Uh, we'll see how we feel about it. It's a secret for now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And you are also calling or uh, accelerators right now. Yes, correct. Now OpenVC can. Uh, so we had VC firms, and now we're also opening up to accelerators. enter investors incubators startup studios we really want yeah. to allow founders to find a whole range of funding options in one place on openvc i see okay so i'm i'm going to end end with this last question okay and i mm-hmm. i because I, i was very curious as to how you got connected to sean gold oh i think on slack <laughs> okay i think we 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 connected on slack originally the, the the very beginning yeah 
it's yeah. a small I, world i don't know i i, I you put yourself yeah it's it's a, it's a really small world yeah yeah i i had a discussion with sean and it was just super fun man like his energy is very contagious yeah, he's, he's hilarious yeah yeah he's so much fun <laughs>